Well, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in the book of Genesis, and I'm going to do just a very brief, um, a little brief summary of where we've been. Genesis is a very interesting book, and if you can't believe Genesis, you'll not do very good with the rest of the Bible. So we have to believe what the Word says, and uh, Genesis is a great place to start because there is a lot of history there, and a lot of the uh, major doctrines of the Bible are found there in shadows and types of things to come. So let me go all the way back, and if you would just want to flip through your Bible, Genesis chapter 12, uh, this is the call of Abraham, or Abram at the time. He lives in the land of Ur, the Chaldeans. And Abram is called out of that land. That place is uh, polytheistic. They're idol worshipers. And God calls him. He leaves. He goes to Haran. And then he goes on to Canaan. Abraham or Abram builds an altar to the Lord there. And we know at the end of the chapter, there is a famine in Canaan. And he goes on down to Egypt. Now, one of the things we have to realize is God never called him to Egypt. He called him where? To Canaan. And when he goes down to Egypt, he has to lie about his wife, Sarai. And he tries to pawn her off as his sister, trying to save his own neck. And then we're going to learn later, he picks up somebody there in Egypt. And it uh, ends up not well with that uh, a person he brings back from Egypt. Chapter 13, Abraham returns to Canaan from Egypt. There he and Lot separates. They are so blessed. And of course God said in chapter 12 he would bless Abram. And Lot, his nephew, and Abram have herds and flocks so large they have to separate. And then Abram gives his nephew Lot the choice. He said, you choose whatever direction you want to go. I'll go the opposite direction. And we know Lot chose the, the well-watered plains of the Jordan Valley. And we know he ends up where? In Sodom. And there is another story about that coming later. In Genesis 14, that is the battle of the kings. These um, city-states around the bottom part of the uh, Dead Sea, or we would call the Salt Sea, They've been paying tribute to some of the northern kingdoms in Babylon, and then they rebelled. After about 12, 13 years, they said, we're not going to pay the tribute or the taxes to you anymore. And then those kings came down, and they defeated those city-states and took their plunder, their goods, and the people. And Lot was caught up in that capture, and he is one of the captives when Abram hears that, he gathers his men up, about 318, and they go find them uh, up north of Damascus. They defeat that army, bring back the people, the spoils of war, and that is where he encounters a king priest by the name of Melchizedek. And the last time I taught, we took a lot of time talking about this, uh, this character, Melchizedek, his name means king of righteousness. Melech means king. The last part means righteous. The Bible says he's both a king and a priest, so he's a type of Christ. There Abram pays him tribute. He gives him 10% of what he had received. And uh, Melchizedek brought out the bread and the wine to uh, Abram, and that's the first mention of what we would call the elements of communion there in that passage in chapter 14. So now we're at chapter 15. So if you'd like to get there, I'm going to begin at verse number 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring, Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So God promised um, Abram that he was going to be the father. Of course, the, the, the name Abram means father. And so at age 75, up until this point, Abram and Sarah have no children. And now Abram says, uh, the only heir I have is someone who's been born in my house, and that is this, this guy, Eliezer, and um, he thinks he's going to be the heir. Verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven, 
and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And now we're going to get into that just a little bit. I don't know how many stars you can see with the naked eye, but I would think that you couldn't count a whole lot on one starry night, even though there's a lot there. So you think, well, I can count a lot of stars, but I'm going to give you some numbers here in a minute that might blow your mind. And he said, so shall your descendants be. Verse 6, and he believed the Lord, and he accounted to him for righteousness. So Abram believed God, and the Lord said, okay, because you believe me, then I'm going to count that to you for righteousness. How many of you know the Bible says that we have no righteousness in ourselves? Our righteousness has is filthy rags. But as we believe in the Lord, he imparts and imputes his righteousness to us by faith. So Abraham in the, the, the New Testament is called what? The father of faith. So that's where we get the term. And so now in chapter 15, he's reaffirming the promise that I'm going to bring children to you. Now, Abraham is willing to compromise this promise with this alternative heir. So God has to say, no, the heir is going to come from your own body. It's not going to be this person that you're seeing and saying. He's going to do this again in chapter 16. How many of you know sometimes it's easy to compromise the things of God? Because we don't see it. We don't see how it could happen. We don't see you know, how God could do this. So we begin to try to compromise the things of God. But sometimes we just got to let God be God. I mean, he, he, you know, he, he knows the, the end from the beginning. He knows how to do what we need done. And sometimes we say, God, you know, I, I, I think maybe this would be the way to do it. Have you ever found yourself counseling God? God, this is what I think. Or this would be good for you to do this. And I've even said this, Lord, this would be a good day for you to come, right? And, and I don't think God needs my counsel, but every once in a while I kind of tell him, this would be great for you to do this. It may be good for you to maybe do it this way, or this would be good timing. But uh, I don't think God really needs my counsel. So chapter 15 again, verse 7 and 8. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur the Chaldees, uh, Chaldeans, and that's where you know, he was originally from, to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? How will I know that I will inherit this land? So verses 9 through 17, the reason God wanted him to know and have surety is through covenant. Say that with me, through covenant. And I'll say it again, through covenant. God is big on covenant. So the first time we really understand covenant is with Noah. So when Noah stepped off of the ark and God said, I'm going to give you a sign or I'm going to give you a sign of the covenant. And that sign was what? The rainbow. And he said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm never going to destroy the earth with water again. A few times I thought maybe that was not going to be the case, but he said, I'm not going to destroy the, the world with water. So the, the bow in the, in the sky is the, the, the token of the covenant. So in, in verses 9 through 17, God makes a covenant with Abram, and what he does, they take the sacrifice, they part the sacrifice, the blood is shed, and Abraham and God make this covenant agreement. Now, in the Old Testament, much of the covenants always included blood. And, of course, that is a foreshadowing of what would happen at the cross because when Jesus Christ went to the cross, we know that uh, they whipped him, they beat him, crown of thorns. Uh, he's nailed to the cross. They pierced his side. When they pierced his side, the Bible says, out came what? Blood and water. So we know that we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, what he did at the cross. We're saved by grace through faith. And so that faith is we're believing in what he did, that atoning death, that blood that was shed is for us. Much like the lamb that would come later for Passover, they would put the, the blood over the, the doorpost. And how many of you know Jesus Christ is the true Lamb of God? So we, we see this in types and shadows. So God makes the covenant with Abram. Now this is what we know about God. God will not break his covenant. How I many you know we can trust God? And what's interesting about Abram here is when the Bible paints the picture of this man that we know as the father of faith, the Bible paints the picture of warts and all. Now by that I mean 
Abram makes some pretty dumb mistakes. Now, when I read about Abram making some pretty bad mistakes, it gives me hope that God could love me and he could use me. So when the Lord talks about Abram or Isaac or Jacob or he talks about David or Solomon, we, we have these men uh, given to us not just as perfect or they never made a mistake. Guess what? We, we see their, their victories. We see their faults. We see their failures. So God doesn't say, let me just show you the good side. He says, let me just show you who they are. And when we get to the book of James, do you remember the, the, the word about Elijah in the book of James? He was a man just like us. A man of like passions, just like us. So we have our, our good days, we have our bad days, we, we have our victories, we have our defeats, we, we have our good moments and our bad moments. And so when the Bible talks about Abram or David or any of these men, we see the totality of who they are. They're not just painted with the good brush, right? So God makes the covenant. There is a revelation in the midst of the covenant. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. But in the middle of the covenant, this is what God says to Abram. He says, your descendants will be in a foreign land as strangers for 400 years. He said, I will judge this land that they're held in. And when your descendants leave, they will come out with great possessions. So what's he foretelling here? Egypt. Did you catch it? So he says, Abram, your descendants, after you're dead and gone will go down to a foreign land as strangers. They're going to be there about 400 years, but I'm going to bring them out. And when they come out, they're going to have great possessions. And when we get over into the book of Exodus, hence the Exodus, then we know that God did bring them out through the leadership of Moses, through the plagues. And before they came out, the Lord said, you can spoil the Egyptians, take what they have as you leave, and let me tell you, the Egyptians were glad to give it. Let me tell you why they were glad to give it. Because through the ten plagues, they were ready for the Hebrews to leave. Adios, whatever I got, you can have, just get out of Dodge, right? So the Lord spoke about this in Genesis chapter 15. So in the midst of the covenant, God gives revelation. Now, that makes me to know when I go into covenant with God, God's able to give me information, give me help, give me insight in things that I don't know. Do you believe that? I believe that. And today the Holy Spirit can teach us and lead us and guide us and, and, and be our informant, if you will, in the things that we really need. So, so here we have a revelation in the midst of the covenant. Verse 18. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gershagites, the Jebusites, the Termites. I mean, we, there's a lot of ice right there. So he, he goes through... He goes through a, a, a territorial description, and then he goes through a people description. So I want you to see, I've got three maps here, and we're going to put these maps up. This in the, the, the white with Star of David in it, this is the region. This is very interesting. I, I've never taught on this like this to bring maps, but I, I thought I need to do that tonight. This white area... If you will look up in, in the, the top right, that kind of squiggly line that borders the, the orange and the dark blue, that is the river of Euphrates that flows from Turkey all the way down to the Gulf. This other white on the other side of the uh, Red Sea would be the Nile River, the squiggly, that goes down to what we would say the top of Ethiopia. So if you, if you go back to this verse, he says from... Uh, Egyptian, uh, Egypt, the Nile, over to the other river, Euphrates. He says, so in between these spaces, he says, Abram, this is the land that I give you to inherit. Now, the next uh, is a different rendition of this. It shows it in green. So the green area would be the same place. 
And you can see part of Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, some of the Arab uh, countries that would go along the, the Gulf there. Uh, United uh, Emirates would be there. Qatar would be there. Uh, some of those countries, uh, Iraq, Iran. So these are the areas that God told Abram, I give it to you for an inheritance. Now, here, here's the caveat. He said, wherever the sole of your feet treads, whatever you possess, this land is yours. I give it to you. It's your inheritance. Now, the next map is... See that dark shaded area in the region of Israel that goes all the way up to what we would say modern day Iraq is. You see the Mediterranean on the left and then the, the Sinai Peninsula, if you will, is that little kind of triangle shape that goes down to the, to the Red Sea. That little dark area is the extent of Solomon's kingdom. Solomon's kingdom is the greatest expanse of the nation of Israel ever. So David expanded the kingdom. Then Solomon came along, and what did he do? He expanded the kingdom even more. Now, if y'all would flip back to the other two maps for me, and let's go all the way back to the uh, one that has the white. Yeah, right there. So think about that little dark green uh, swatch right through that area, through the Mediterranean. And now look at the white. Let me ask you a question. Do you think sometimes God makes us big promises and we never really get all the promise? That's a good question, isn't it? Sometimes God says, all of this is yours. All you have to do is take it. And all they did was take just a little sliver of what God promised. Now, when I thought about that today, let, let's leave you out of the loop. Let me put myself into the loop. Sometimes I think God has more for me than I'm willing to possess. Sometimes I think God has more for me than I'm willing to believe for. So let's go back to Abram. God says, Abram, from the Nile, sweep all the way around to the Euphrates. Everywhere your sole of your foot treads, all this land is yours. All you have to do is take it. And the largest expanse of Israel was under King Solomon, and it was just a little bitty swatch in light of all that land. I'm just letting you digest that just for a little bit. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? Now, that little bitty green slice there is all they took when all the rest of it was available to them. Even in the time of Moses as they were getting ready to go into the promised land, especially Joshua and the judges that followed after that. The Bible says that they didn't even take all of Canaan, just that little swatch right along the Mediterranean that we would know as modern-day Israel. And one of the reasons they didn't take it is because they weren't willing to drive the enemy out of their land. God says it's yours, but you have to drive them out. And sometimes we have promises that we just don't drive the enemy out of. And we could have more territory, maybe more promises, uh, maybe more blessings, maybe uh, more than we could have if we would just believe and be willing to go there. Do y'all receive that? That's interesting. Very interesting. Okay, let, let, let's move on. So here we are, chapter 15. God makes the promise. Now let's... Let's switch over to chapter number 16. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maid servant whose name was Hagar. So question, where did they pick up Hagar? When they went down to Egypt, at the bottom of chapter 12, God called Abram to Canaan, he never called Abram to Egypt, but there was a famine in the land when they got to Canaan, and they thought they couldn't survive there, so then they went on down to Egypt. He has to lie about his wife. Uh, he, he leaves Egypt. They take a young uh, servant girl to be Sarai's handmaiden. This is where Hagar comes in, 
And sometimes when you and I get out of the will of God, we pick up stuff we shouldn't have. We, we bring things back with us that maybe it would be best for us not to have. And that's exactly what happened to Abram and Sarai. So verse number two, so Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. So Abram and Sarai are now 86 and 76. So the promise comes when they're what? Uh, 75 and 65. Now, I, I would have to say, b- because um, I, I'm older than all those ages right, that I j- just said, so if, if you came to me and said, uh, Mike, I, I think you and Carrie, it would be great for you to have children, I would say, uh, what a great thought. <laughs> Not. Uh, children are for young people, right? But here they are. They're at 86 and 76, and they still have no child, and God promised them that they would have a child. Uh, 11 years have passed. They, they, they've tried. They've waited for 11 long years. Now they take matters into their own hands. So sometimes when God doesn't answer us on our timetable, when he doesn't answer us the way that we think he should answer us, and let me leave you out of it, sometimes I feel like I need to help God. God, God, do you need some help? Let me help you. And that usually always turns out bad. Because number one, God doesn't need my advice. And number two, he doesn't need my help. I know that shocks you tonight, but this is what Abram and Sarai do. So Sarai says, so God made the promise when we were 65 and 75, nothing has happened in 11 years. We have this handmaiden, she's young, so Abram, why don't you uh, take her and birth a child and I will adopt the child, we'll raise the child, and maybe this is what God meant. We will have an heir. So they, they take the matters into their own hands, and they're going to help God out. And how do you know it turns really wrong? And it's still wrong today. And I'll share that with you here in a minute. So Hagar bears a son. So when she bears the son, immediately Sarai, who would later become Sarah, despises Hagar and hates her. Because the thing that she wanted to do, she could not do. Now Hagar has the son, and it is Abram's son, but it's not through his wife, Sarah or Sarai. And now she despises Hagar. And she goes to her husband, Abram. Let's pick it up in verse 5. You're going to get a kick out of this. Then Sarai said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Sarah, let me remind you here. This was your idea. But who's she blaming? Her husband. Wives, I know you would never, ever do that. I was visiting with a gentleman this last week, and he said, you know, sometimes I have to be careful what I say to my wife because I mean it good, but it just turns out all wrong. I said, really? We have never been through that before. So this is what Sarai says. says, my wrong be upon you. This is your fault. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and you. Hey, it's me or you, buddy. What's this going to be, me or you? So what's Sarai doing? She is calling this thing down. you, you got to do something. And so he turns and says, she's your handmaiden. You can do with her what you want. So what Sarai does, she turns Hagar and the child out. And she despises the situation. She despises Hagar. Obviously, Hagar picks up the vibes pretty, pretty quickly, too, because she refers to this. 
And so they turn Hagar out with this child. So Hagar flees, and guess what direction she goes? Back to Egypt. So we know from the, uh, the names of the places, she's making her way back to where she came from. Have you ever noticed that when we get into trouble or there's a problem, we tend to revert back to what we came out of? Let, let, let me give you just a couple of uh, illustrations. Um, one of the, that stands out to me, remember when, when uh, Peter denied the Lord and then the Lord is you know, crucified and um, they you know, doubt, I guess, whether he's going to be resurrected and then the Lord you know, returns and in the midst of all that, there, this famous line of Peter, he turns to the rest of them and he says, I'm going fishing. You know what he does? He reverts, he reverts right back to what he was doing before. So Peter was a fisherman, so when it didn't turn out the way he thought. You see, they kind of thought Jesus was going to become the king of the Jews, and he is king of the Jews. I don't even know he's king of the world. But they thought he was going to take this place of kingship, kick the Romans out, restore Israel. And of course, he is going to restore everything, but it wasn't their way, it wasn't their timing. And then all of a, all of a sudden, Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. So he's reverting back to the way he was. And so anyway, that, that's kind of a tendency we have in our human experience. So Hagar flees, returns back toward Egypt. Verse 9. So picture her going back to Egypt, very tough, very arid. Uh, her and the child may both die. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress, submit yourself under her hand, then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted, uh, they shall not be counted for multitude, or they're going to be many. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child. You shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man. So this is the prophecy from the angel of the Lord. This term, angel of the Lord, is the first time that it appears in your Bible. Now, it's going to appear other times. The book of Job talks about this. But the angel of the Lord is the first time it appears in your Bible. Now, a lot of people have different opinions who the angel of the Lord is. So angel in that text can mean messenger, the messenger of the Lord. Some people believe this is a Christophany, which means this is a pre-appearance of Jesus before Bethlehem. Some people believe this is Gabriel, the one who gives messages. If you go back to this time of the year, remember in, in Matthew 1, Luke 2, uh, we have the Annunciation, and guess what angel came to share the message? It was the angel Gabriel. So some people believe this is Gabriel. Now, it doesn't say that, but I'm just telling you these are the, the two views. So the angel of the Lord says, okay, you're pregnant with child. You and the child, you're, you're, you're trying to get back to, even though Ishmael's not born yet, but you and the child are trying to get back to Egypt. What you need to do is go back home, or go back to your mistress. Submit yourself to her. And uh, this baby, you're going to call his name Ishmael. So in both of the cases, with both of Abram's sons, the name is given to them before the babies are born. Just as this Christmas season, the angel said to Mary and Joseph, here's a good baby book, pick out a name and name the child. No. The angel said to Mary and Joseph, thou shalt call his name Jesus. So the angel said, this is what you named the baby. The angel of the Lord said to Hagar, this is what you named the baby. And we're going to read here in a minute. The Lord's going to tell Abram and Sarai, this is what you named the baby. So in all of these cases, the baby's names are given before the babies are born. Does that sound a little interesting to you? It does me. So here she's going back. So follow along with me. This is, I mean, this is very, to me, very exciting because in this prophecy about Ishmael, and let me finish it up, and every man's hand is against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brothers. So Ishmael is going to be a wild person. 
He's going to be in a lot of conflict, and he's going to be in conflict with a lot of people in every man's hand against him, and he will dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. So Ishmael's name means God will hear. That's what his name means, God will hear. This first reference to the angel of the Lord giving this information, and then Hagar calls the Lord the God who sees me. The God who sees me. So she is in distress. She's pregnant, trying to get back to uh, Egypt. I'm sure because of the influence of, 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 of Abram and Sarai, uh, she knows that they worship uh, Jehovah God. And so she calls out on the name of the Lord. And his name, this baby to be born, means God will hear. And then she calls the Lord the God who sees me. And then she says, I have seen him who sees me. Isn't that a great line? I have seen him who sees me. So I don't know if she's referring to the angel of the Lord in his glory, the Lord speaking through the angel, or this is a pre-appearance of Bethlehem uh, of Jesus Christ before he has a fleshly body. So at any juncture here of whatever you think, Hagar knows that she's seen something supernatural, something very uh, uh, wonderful, and she says, the God who sees me, I have seen him who sees me. Aren't you glad God sees you? That he's watching over us. So let's shift gears. Now we're going into chapter 17. And let me read verses 1 through 6. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face. God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. Now, at 99 years old, God changes his name. We know Abram means father. It's, you know, Abba, father. Abraham means father. The, the problem is his name means father and he has no children. So how would you like going around with a nickname or a name of father and someone says, how many kids do you have? And you say, I don't have any. Well, your name means father. Yeah, it does, but I don't have any kids. And now, God one-ups it. He said, no longer are you going to be called Father. I'm going to call you Abraham, which means father of many or father of multitudes. And now, let, let's, uh, <laughs> let, let's compound the problem here. So you're called Abraham, father of many. So you got a lot of kids. No, don't have one. So that's where he's at. Why does God do that? God calls those things that are not as though they were. You know what faith is? Faith is calling something, believing something, choosing to do something before it ever comes into reality. And that's what God does here. So God is, God is being true to his own plan, his own ways. He's calling things that are not as though they were. I'm going to call you Father now I'm going to one up it. I'm going to call you father of a multitude, father of nations. And he still doesn't have any kids except, you know, Ishmael. But, uh, you know, here, here you go. That's what God does. He changes his name. And here in a minute, he's going to change, change Sarai's name too. So he says, nations shall come from you. You will be exceedingly fruitful. And he says, kings shall come from you. So God changes his name at 99. Then he says, walk before me and be blameless. He says, I'm almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. Would you agree with me that Abraham was anything but blameless? Sure. I mean, th this guy's making mistake after mistake after mistake. Well, the first thing he does, he, he goes to Egypt when God didn't call him there. He gets there and he starts lying about his wife. That's not cool. Then he brings back a servant girl, Hagar. Then he tries to help God out with his servant, Eliezer, to be his heir. Now he has sex with the handmaiden, Hagar. 
has another son by the name of Ishmael trying to help God out. And then at 99, <laughs> the Lord says, Abraham, would you, would you cut that out? Would you stop making all these mistakes? Would you walk before me and try to be blameless here? Aren't you glad God just doesn't give up on you? In the middle of all your mistakes and your faults, God is still with you. And he says, come on, I'm going to go before you, but I want you to walk with me. And if you walk with me, let's try to do what's right here. I tell you what, I, I'm getting a lot out of this because I, I see myself here. And maybe you see yourself there. Walk before me and be blameless. Now, this is the promises he makes. He said, I'll multiply you. You're going to be the father of many nations, and kings will come from you. So let me throw this up here. The population of the Arab nations today is about 436 million people. The population of the Jewish people is 15.2 million people. Do you think God kept his promise? So let's add those up. What, what are we at? Uh, uh, close to 450 million people? So Abraham, look up. Can you count 450 million stars? And have you know, God's not finished yet. The descendants of Abraham are still multiplying. And still multiplying through Ishmael and through Isaac. So now, and I pulled this up, the, the Arab population, because the Arabs and the Jews both converge back and they say their fathers who? Abraham. Because they take their descendants from Ishmael, who came from Abraham, and then the Jewish come through Isaac, and the Lord says, Abram, look up, count the stars. So in 2021, we're at about 450 million, and God's not finished yet. Amazing. Amazing. But you know, sometimes God says things to us we just can't grasp quite at the time. But yet God's still working. He, he's still doing what he does. He, he's still completing the plan. And maybe God's spoken something to you. And he shared something with you, and you say, I don't know how that could ever happen. And let me tell you, at 190, Abram being 100 and Sarah being 90, I bet they're still thinking, I don't have a clue how this could ever happen. And smile at me because if you were 100 and your wife was 90, or you were 90 and your husband was, was, was 100, you would be saying the same thing. I don't know how this could happen. I see some smiles out there. And that's where they're at. But yet God still had a promise. So verses 9 through 14. So if you have your Bible there, just kind of look over that. Abraham receives what we know as the covenant of circumcision. The covenant of circumcision. Now, at this time, these are not the only people who circumcise. Uh, many different uh, uh, ethnic groups and tribes did. Many did not. But the Lord said to Abraham, he said, the token of the covenant that I made with you is going to be circumcision. You're going to circumcise your male sons. Now, circumcision is the cutting away of the foreskin or the flesh when we read the New Testament, it is a typology, and this is what it says in the New Testament, that we're circumcised in our heart, that God takes that fleshly nature out of us, out of our life, out of our heart, and that circumcision is a token of that covenant that God commanded Abraham. If you've never listened to Dr. Jeff give the medical terminology of the Old Testament. How many of you were here when Dr. Jeff did a whole series on that? Extremely, extremely interesting and informational. God told them that on the eighth day is when you circumcise your sons. So question, why the eighth day? So Dr. Jeff, being a very smart medical guy, he said this is why God said circumcise on the eighth day. 
the vitamin K in a baby doesn't fully develop. The, cl the clotting process of a baby doesn't fully develop until the eighth day. And we did not know that until about the 20th century. But how many of you know God knew that from the beginning? So when he said, circumcise the eighth day, our medical researchers found out the clotting factor of a baby is not fully developed until the eighth day. Now, you say, well, pastor, why do they circumcise babies now right after they're born? Because they can give them an injection of vitamin K and start the clotting process immediately in a baby. But back then, they couldn't. So eighth day, the full clotting process of the, the blood is on the eighth day. Isn't that, isn't that something? So that's given to Abram. This is the sign of the covenant. It is circumcision. Verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abraham, you got to love this verse. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed when God said, yeah, she's going to have a baby. At 90, you at 100. Now, this is Abraham's response to that. This is so funny. He laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? And Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. He's thinking, Oh, let's do it through Ishmael. Because I don't see how it could happen with a 100-year-old guy and a 90-year-old woman. Now this is God's response. Verse 19, then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant... I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. Now, God is saying, you're going to have a son. You're going to call his name what? Isaac. He hasn't been born yet, but this is what you're going to call him. Isaac's name means laughter. And let me tell you why God said name him Isaac. In both of the instances, when Abram hears this, and now when later on Sarah hears this, the response from Abraham and Sarah, when they hear, you are going to have a baby, they both laugh. It's not just one of them, they both laugh. And his name literally means laughter. And so God says, this is what you're going to call his name. And God said this before they laughed because he knew what they were going to do, right? So you're going to call his name Isaac. Now, he says this set time next year. So the set time is what going to be nine months. That's the gestation period. So in nine months, next year, you're going to have a baby. You're going to name him Isaac. This covenant that I made with you is going to carry on through Isaac. The, the blessing that I gave you is going to carry on through Isaac. And so this is going to be a generational thing. It's not just going to be with you, Abram. It's going to be with you. It's going to be with your children. It's going to be with your grandchildren. And throughout the Bible, God is known as the God of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Have you ever read that? I mean, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Aren't you glad God is a generational God? That, that he, he can touch our life, he can touch our kids' life, he can touch our great uh, grandchildren's life. I mean, this can be a perpetual thing. As long as we serve God and, and we believe in the promises of God and we walk in the ways of God, then this blessing can go from generation to generation to generation. But on the flip side of that, how many of you know a curse can do the same thing? I mean, the, the things that I do wrong, maybe the habits, the addictions, the lifestyle I have can perpetuate from generation to generation until someone breaks it through the power of God. 
So not only, you know, some people say, well, it's generational curses. Well, sometimes it's just generational decisions. Somebody can just decide, I'm not going to live like that anymore. I'm going to live in a different way. So, so now we, we go through these chapters, and, and now we're uh, uh, through this uh, last one, which is uh, chapter 17. And uh, the reason I wanted to go through this is because you really need to have a real solid foundation of how this began, the father of faith, uh, when you read other things in, in the Old Testament, especially when you get over to the New Testament, if you don't have any of this information, the others doesn't make much sense because you don't have any foundation or background to relate it to. So when I was uh, you know, going through the book of uh, uh, Genesis and just looking at some things, there, there's an atheist um, website that does uh, YouTube videos on the chapters of the Bible. So I thought, I'm going to go back and I'm going to listen to some of the atheist response to some of the biblical narratives in Scripture. So I did that today. So it's very interesting that some of these people who, quote, are experts on the Bible know nothing about the Bible. So you take some of the information that we have here uh, tonight. So their response to this is, the Bible's referring to names and places and people who haven't even been born yet, that haven't even been uh, described yet until later in the Bible. Well, I want to say, Yehu, let me explain that to you. Do you ever talk back to people that can't hear you? Because if you're reading like this like it's happening uh, live, you have to think that Adam didn't write this. Noah didn't write this. Abraham didn't write this. The best we can understand is that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible. And Moses already knew what the places were named. He knew who the people were. He knew the tribes were. And so he is referring historical information that he receives from God in a way that the people would understand it even though he writes it years later, and that's why the atheist doesn't understand this is how the Bible's written. How many of you are tracking with me here? So when you listen to some of the commentary, how could this be? It's because Noah didn't write it, Abraham didn't write it, Isaac didn't write it, Jacob didn't write it, we think Moses wrote it, and so he's given us this historical information that he's already privy to. He already knows where the tribes are living. He already knows what the cities are. And so if you're reading this now, then when he says a place, you can identify with that place, even though that place was maybe not named that or uh, connected to that at that time, but yet you can, you can understand that. Does that make sense? Stand with me. We're done. 